looks like we have some people who want to find out about depression. <laughs> it seems to me that the main problem involving our emotional tensions at the moment is to consider, if possible, the purpose for which we are in this world. The pervading attitude is that we are born here to enjoy ourselves, to work as little as possible, be paid as much as the allowances permit, and advance our own personal interests, attitudes, ambitions, and aspirations with no consideration for each other. It is a rugged individualism which is gradually changing into a ragged individualism. We are asking too much and giving too little to this embodiment. This is not a holiday in this world. We are here to learn, we are here to work, and we are here to gain certain pleasures, joys, and satisfactions, and fulfillments as a result of personal effort. All this seems to be contrary to the prevailing temper. Everything today is focused upon exploiting the individual, especially in the area of his luxuries. He is expected to have continually increasing appetites, whether or not he has any means of paying for them. He wants more and more for doing less and less, and almost everyone is geared and keyed to a delusion. This is a delusion to assume that this material existence is here primarily to produce millionaires, to enable us to speculate generously in various commodities to live beyond our means and never suffer for it, and be continuously dissatisfied with what we have because of pernicious advertising. All in all, we are in trouble, and we have no real answer to the trouble in the form of a general reform in society. The probability of four billion people suddenly becoming enlightened and resolved to do the right thing is rather remote, if especially when we realize that most of these people do not even speak the same language. Also, their ideas of values are different, and each one has its own peculiar pattern of living. And this goes on and on and on throughout the entire structure of human society. As we look about us for a panacea, for a remedy, we invest in every type of an extravagant uh, political situation that comes along. We are constantly seeking some form of panacea which will cure our ills but not interfere with our mistakes. Those mistakes are sacred. We not only have a right to them, we will fight to the bitter end to prove that they are correct mistakes. <laughs> and this in itself becomes a rather, rather painful situation. Looking around us, we observe everywhere that the nervous tensions are rising rapidly. We are less and less organized as persons. Individuals who ten years ago had a good memory now forget the most common incidents in their lives. Persons who were satisfied with moderate income suddenly find moderation to be a penalty. Those who have for generations been grateful to this earth for taking care of them now resent the fact that it cannot provide them with every luxury that they want. As long as we have a mistaken philosophy of life, we are certainly going to be under stress. The human body is a wonderful thermometer. 
It helps us very clearly and definitely to discover the, what is wrong with the temperatures within ourselves. And at this time, fatigue, disillusionment, disappointment, fear, anxiety, dread, and almost panic, these fa forces are working everywhere in our society. If there is any possibility of correcting the situation, it certainly rests with ourselves. We cannot depend upon our neighbors changing. We have no way of assuring that our public officials will be reform their ways. We have no reason to hope that business will suddenly become philanthropic. We cannot change anything in this world with certainty except ourselves. And no one can prevent us from changing ourselves if we so desire. The individual who is tired of complaints, who is weary with the body's reactions to pressure, who cannot afford expensive medications, who has tried 16 different diets and is still overweight, all these people have got to sit down and face the facts of life. They have to realize that we have to have our happiness in our own names. We can be as happy as we are intelligent, and we can be as miserable as we are foolish. Now, how are we going to go after this particular problem? There are several different approaches to it, but nearly all depend upon one essential decision or commitment within ourselves. We must have a sincere desire to solve some of the problems that face us as individuals. We must consecrate our lives to getting out of the dilemmas that are destroying health, happiness, and peace of mind. We are only here for a relatively short time, at least in this embodiment, perhaps 80, perhaps 90 years maybe occasionally a few extra years thrown in for good measure. But in this span of time, we must make a series of decisions. From the beginning to the end, we must steer our living with intelligence. When intelligence fails, security fails. How are we going to get this intelligence? Well, for a long time, we thought we could get it by education. But this is becoming increasingly doubtful. The trouble with education is that it assists us to adjust to what is wrong, but does not attempt to correct the errors. Therefore, education says the world is as it is. Adjust to it or suffer. Therefore, education gives us various instructions on how to make the best of the bad bargain that we call life. It helps us to have a trade or an art, and whenever something new comes along, education works it over until it becomes obsolete. For a long, long time, we have been training people for special fields of activity which generally cease to be important by the time the training is complete. So all these different situations have impelled us to realize that education is not giving us the internal resource necessary to control ourselves. Education will help us to do the best we can as long as we remain inadequate. Education will also try to get us to get our minds off of our troubles by the hope of executive promotion in business. It assumes that if we know enough, study hard enough, and graduate successfully enough, we can live in reasonable comfort during our present embodiment. This is a beautiful thought, but is not supported by common evidence today. The next point that comes along, perhaps, 
is religion. Religion tries to explain to us that there are values that are more important than material success. This would be more uh, convincing if so many different beliefs were not themselves developing very selfish attitudes and uh, were, are working for material success. Actually, the primary contribution of religion is to dedicate the individual to principles, to make him understand why he has to keep rules if he wants to be happy. Religion would also offer him the instrument of faith. He would be able to feel that there is a power in nature working on his side as long as he behaves himself. This does affect and does encourage and does help a great many persons. On the other hand, many who try this method become disillusioned because religion does not work miracles in their personal problems. Philosophy would help if there was any, but philosophy is in a very bad condition at the present time. It is very largely merely a matter, as Voltaire pointed out, of individuals throwing stools at each other. The philosophers are all divided into various groups, and most of which are as difficult to reconcile as religious sectarians are. On the other hand, there is something new arriving and arising in the philosophical world, and that is psychology. Now, psychology started out by being a rather bright star of hope and is still a very important approach to the problems of life. Psychology can, in many instances, demonstrate why the individual is in trouble, but it cannot always per persuade him to change his ways. Those who are emotionally and mentally depressed are very much like alcoholics. They know that they are wrong, but they cannot break the negative habits. So we have to face the fact that there is no easy way to break a long-established pattern of attitudes. We begin to develop attitudes when we are children, and by the time we reach middle life, the attitudes control us. We are no longer able to clearly resist the pressure of our own emotional and mental complexes. As a result of this inability to face facts, we go on catering to partly fulfilled ambitions until finally we drift out of this world and all that relates to it, at least temporarily. Out of this world, therefore, is another realm of uncertainties. Many persons who cannot live well here, or do not, have a very strong hope that they will do better after death, that somewhere out there is a reward for all of the suffering they do here. Now, the principle of reward for suffering would be a pretty serious and pretty substantial if we were not personally the cause of our own suffering. But this kind of cuts into the idea of universal justice. In other words, heaven is a presumed to reward us bountifully for our own mistakes. This is a, a dubious point of view. If we try hard, we may gain a certain overtone of recognition and reward. But to do nothing and expect to receive universal commendation for it is not reasonable or very practical, and there's no proof that it ever works out. Now, if this is true, and all we can hope for is the courage, strength, and resolution to do what we know we ought to, how are we going to evaluate the situations we find ourselves involved in at the present time. One of the first and most important problems that we all face 
is the effort in one way or another to live on a pattern or in a pattern with a minimum of stress. It is very important to our health and happiness that we use as little energy as possible uh, repenting our own actions. It is also very important that we should not undertake projects which will destroy us in the hope of some special reward. The person should try to live within his own natural capacities and not be constantly moved by the fact that there are others who are doing better than he is. Various capacities have to be recognized. Many folks will learn to play the piano, but there will not be very many Paderewskis. But you do not have to be a great master of an art in order to enjoy it. You do not have to have either a grand opera or a Nashville rock voice in order to enjoy singing. You can enjoy it by the mere fact that no one ever will hear anyone whose music sounds better than his own. It's the way people think and feel. They enjoy even moderate successes. One way to get out of our stress is to become more pleasant in the presence of moderate successes. That we do the simple things that give simple pleasures and avoid these tremendous activities which are so likely to fall apart. So if we t realize that we are all a little different, but that this difference does not make it necessary for us to suffer, we will gain a new perspective on some of our problems. Each person should live within his means, and this does not necessarily simply mean his financial means. It means to live within his capacities, to live on a level in which he can be comfortable, reasonable, and free as far as possible from unnecessary worries and anxieties. Today we have a very serious problem arising that is affecting a great many people, and that is the problem of unemployment. Unemployment is becoming a major disaster, not only in this country, but in most parts of the world. We have reached a point in technology in which we are gradually running ourselves and each other into bankruptcy. We are constantly seeking to broaden the measure of profits and gradually reducing the employable in these various fields. Now everyone is subject to the danger of one of these problems hitting home. From now on out, the problem of economic security is always going to be a subject of hazard. One day we may succeed, the next day it may take a, a, all that we have to survive. We do not know what lies ahead, but we do know that there is grave possibility, at least, that an effort to perpetuate prosperity is going to end in tragedy. Therefore, from the very day in which we first realize this fact, each person should quietly organize his own resources. He should discover what is necessary and what is luxury. And he should realize that nature did not necessarily intend him uh, to be a glamorous personality. If we are still working and we still have some economic security, the situation demands greater thoughtfulness and organization of these resources. Mental and emotional depression are closely related to debt, and the individual who is in debt is in trouble. Ben Franklin pointed that out over 200 years ago. The individual who buys what he doesn't need, either because his neighbor has it, or because it is fashionable, or because it is a luxury 
and a labor-saving device that is not essentially necessary. People who spend money in this way are apt to regret it. Now, if they are more economical, they may also have a tendency to tip the economic system into a more moderate relationship with the consumer. It is necessary for business to realize that it cannot flourish by making individuals into bankrupts. That when the individual spends more than he can, business itself is ultimately going to suffer. So if we are employed and we have reasonable securities and we can perhaps feel that we could splurge, this is an excellent time to realize that splurging is not the basis of happiness. Uh, it is really something which will only ultimately contribute to worry and anxiety. Now, if the person is not employed at the moment, and therefore has a problem involving labor unions or involving the curtailments and bankruptcies of various corporations, then it is too late to try to prevent the situation. It is then necessary to do whatever can be done to reduce the pressure and to get into as economical a balance as possible. This very often will result in the loss of luxuries. But if it is in the cause of securities, the individual will have less medical bills if he has fewer luxuries. There is no sense in trying to maintain a standard of life which has been taken away. But let us always remember that the standard that has been taken away has nothing to do with the standard of principles within ourselves. A high standard of living depends upon what we are and not upon what we have. And very often a reduction in our luxuries results in an improvement in our integrities. So wherever necessary or possible, the individual should begin to discipline his appetites. Not long ago, a friend of mine took two or three people to dinner in one of our moderately fashionable restaurants. The dinner for four cost him $125. The food value was probably about $750. The rest was prestige. Well, prestige is something that the average person today cannot afford. It is not necessary for him to retire to a one-arm lunch counter, but it is necessary to be thoughtful and to curb extravagances. And the person who says, I'm going to be extravagant now because I do not know how long I can keep it up, is foolish. The purpose is to move and smooth out a way of life in which there is the greatest probability of being able to live it the rest of your days. And this means a moderate relationship with life itself. It means a, an ability to cope with probabilities of difficulty and stress. Actually, the theory we seem to be working from largely today is that our principal legitimate expenditure should be for entertainment. Uh, this has resulted, of course, in a measure of entertainment which most persons are having more and more difficulty standing. The entertainment field has catered to the worst, and is no, there is no improvement in sight. Extravagant expenditures for modern entertainment is a complete waste of time. This is another problem that people have to face. They've become so accustomed to these matters that they do not think very much about it if they finally decide they would like to pay $100 a month for X picture channels, or would not object to paying $50 a seat for a theater ticket. This type of thinking is going to result in nervous breakdowns for millions and millions of people. You cannot do it that way without worry. 
and for the moment or two, an hour or two of pleasure, or what you think is pleasure. You may pay with hours of worry and anxiety when you can't make the car payment. All of these matters mean that organization of yourself, the, con the clear understanding of what you need, what is necessary, and what is proper. These things must be given their proper consideration. There will always be somebody in this world that has a little more worldly goods than we have. But it's not at all certain that that same person doesn't have more worldly worries than we have. Uh, luxury is a lovely thing if you don't mind worrying yourself to death trying to maintain it. There are false values of all kinds that are being heavily rewarded, and individuals are taught to believe that these false values are worth sacrificing integrity to attain. But they're not. And it's becoming increasingly evident that we are on a very dangerous path at the moment. Actually, however, there's one reassuring point. It's not as bad as it seems to be. Because, as one man said years ago, the less we have, the less we can lose. It is the individual with great holdings who has great losses. And these great losses remind me of the fact that I was on Wall Street when the 1929 depressions hit, and I saw a man walk out of the New York Stock Exchange put a revolver to his head and blow his brains out. Now, we're not doing it quite that way now, because in some way, perhaps, the way things are now, it'd be very hard to hit brains, even with a good shot. <laughs> the, uh, the main point is that a quiet approach to life a moderate approach to life, while it may not be free from all anxieties, reduces them. Reduces them because of the effect it produces in a personal living. At that same time in 29, a number of persons reported that having seen their entire holding wiped out in one day, went home and for the first time in years had a good night's sleep. There was nothing more to worry about. Now, if these persons had been moderate in their investments, wise and thoughtful, had not been over-extravagant in their living, they might have escaped this deluge and have had many good nights sleep because they were never in danger, or the danger was so slight it was scarcely worth considering. We watch each uh, person as the days go along, and we find the friends and relatives and acquaintances becoming more and more edgy. No one seems to be very happy about anything. And nearly everyone has a pet peeve as to what is wrong. If we get about 500 people together, each with a different peeve, and they all express what their peeve was, the composite result would probably be approximately correct. Because there are hundreds of causes for these uncertainties and these uh, unpleasant reactions. The individual has to be careful, however, that he doesn't manufacture difficulties. It's bad enough to face the real ones, but it is even worse to imagine a great number of problems that do not even exist and become frightened to death by the products of your own imagination. Actually, we are all looking for something, someone, that we can blame for this particular problem. Last week I had one envelope come in to me that must have had 50 sheets in it, each containing some definite explanation of who was responsible for everything. It was not only a completely discouraging list, but the question always arose, well, how much fact was there in it? because the, actually the various statements were very lightly uh, supported, if at all. For the most part, it was simply blind anxiety blurting out its fears. Well, 
There is a lot of that these days. Individuals are frightened. Everywhere they turn, they see a conspiracy. Everyone around them is out for something that they have. All around the world, every religion, every political system, every industry, every economy is corrupt and is being used to destroy our peace of mind. It's very, very tragic. But the only answer to it lies in having an indestructible peace of mind. Whatever happens, we will discover, as we have from the past, that the worst does not occur. No matter how much problem and fear and worry we have, or how many conspirators we assume to be hiding somewhere to separate us from a few dollars, the real problem lies still with ourselves, that we cannot afford to develop vast prejudices that divide us socially, religiously, racially, culturally. We cannot afford to look upon everything that is not like ourselves as an enemy. We do not uh, realize the danger of this prejudice problem. And nearly everyone who is unhappy today is pointing an accusing finger at what he regards as the cause of his misery. But up to now, his tendency has to been to point his finger in the wrong direction. He should be pointing it at himself. For here is where the real problem has to rest. It is our own ability to integrate our living and our thinking so that we can fulfill the Bible admonition that if we are right, we will survive, and that those who are wrong may fall on both sides of us, but we will still stand. The problem is always that we must be right. And this is the first line of defense against worry, fear, and anxiety. We have to be correct in our own relationships with life. It might seem that this is a very serious frustration, and perhaps it would be a little bit of a frustration, if this was the only existence that we have. But whatever we do here is certainly going to go on, and we are going to take with us into something beyond this life most of the pressures that have burdened us here. There is no reason to assume that death changes us. It changes our location, it takes away our body, but there is no way of being sure that it changes any mental or emotional attitudes that we may hold. We will probably go on being ourselves, and that means that unless we have done something to improve ourselves, that if and when the time comes to start another pattern of living, we will bring back nothing but the faults and pressures that we took with us. So we have to, in a long-range thinking, try to make the corrections that are necessary while we are here. If the individual believes that he doesn't come back, it still remains the same problem. If he doesn't come back, it's all the more reason why he should do the best he can here and get as much of real value out of life as is possible. So the nervous person has got to sit down and analyze what is the cause of his nerves. What does he dislike? Who is he jealous of? What person is irritating him? Why does he hold on to ambitions and appetites that are unreasonable? Does he really think that by buying the larger house, he's going to be a happier person? Does he really believe that he has to keep up with the Joneses? Does he find it absolutely necessary to make every possible last degree of profit on every transaction that he makes? Is it necessary for him to profit to the point that he prevents other human beings from having the proper necessities of life? All of this selfishness and self-centeredness is contrary to rules. 
and nature's way of doing things as can be summed in the simple thought. If, there, if we are not reasonably contented, there's something wrong with us. We like to assume that it's wrong with the system, but the system is nothing but a mass of us. The system is a collective picture of our own personal attitudes on the various responsibilities of living. Out of this also comes a new type of escape mechanism. The individual not wishing to change himself has only one way out, and that is to forget himself. Instead of rising above his own weaknesses, he is going to escape from these weaknesses by killing out his own recognition of them. So the person who is nervous or neurotic or depressed goes on a medication. If he is depressed, he may be given a stimulant. If he is overexcited and obviously a paranoid, you can give him one or, or another uh, form of sedation. Always the idea is not to cure the problem, but to block the symptom. We are supposed to get well by forgetting what we are supposed to do. But instead of having this happen, we finally discover that we are allergic to the medication and ultimately kill ourselves in the effort to avoid thinking. Also, there is the alcoholic, there is all the different type of escape mechanism. We find people who are living in a very unpleasant, unrealistic, and unmoral way simply to escape the problems of life. Another thing that is very important, and I notice a lot of people seem to be struggling with it, and that is, what is the person doing actually to improve his own mental existence? What are his interests? What does he do to make a better life that will solve some of his problems? He comes home. It's been a hard day at the office. Or it's been a hard day somewhere. Or it's been a day in which there was very little work but a lot of anxiety and irritation. So he comes back. What does he do? Turns on the television. And he's going to live with the television and probably get an indigestion from the television dinner. But he is going to watch the, probably about the lowest level of entertainment that has ever afflicted the American people. He is going to go through all of the murders, all the rape and carnage, all the space wars, all kinds of dramatizations real or unreal, about all the unpleasant moments of history, and a careful program of destroying and disintegrating the reputations of famous persons. This is entertainment. Or, being a nervous and sensitive man, he might go into rock, which will guarantee that he will be in the jitters for the rest of the evening. <laughs> Nothing doing. Nothing is happening. Where is any effort to become a better person? The uh, idea is to slowly drift through this life without noticing it more than necessary. The individual makes no effort to make his homes any kind of a place of securities, and if one person tries desperately, the rest of the family is probably against him. Everywhere, the emphasis is upon mental indolence and emotional agitations. It's become now almost indispensable to our emotional lives that we watch murder, rape, and carnage. It's the only thing which we react to. Every phase of our life is being slowly lowered by the fact that we have made no demands upon ourselves to the fulfillment of our own resources. We are perfectly willing to drift from here to there without any more thought than is absolutely necessary to get across the street in a heavy traffic hour. Sometimes we don't make that. Now, we have a mind. 
which is supposed to give us all kinds of possible usages. There are many interesting, useful, and valuable things to be known and learned. But the mind has also its own willingness to conform to our prevailing inertia. The mind can be just as lazy as the body. The mind can object to thinking on the grounds that it is fatiguing. I know many people who say they gave up thinking because they couldn't live with their own thoughts. Well, it can be. Because if you use the mind simply, without discipline, without direction, and without motive, it can spend its time wandering through a maze of inertias and inadequacies which are worse than nothing. But the mind is there, and everyone can grow and use it. And the time spent in using the mind properly can be saved from the complete waste of mental energy and the corresponding danger to the nervous system. The person who is thoughtful is not going to be nearly as panicky as the thoughtless. And uh, the less organization we have, the more subject we are to adverse crises of one kind or another. If we do not run our lives, circumstances will treat us like a heavy storm will treat a small ship. It is up to us to take hold of these things if we expect them to solve problems for us. Now, on the mental level, apart from the emotional pressures, we have all kinds of inducements to poor thinking. Good reading has become a very rare thing. Nearly all the books that we find now popular, the best sellers, are trivia. They demand nothing and provide some form of more or less transitory and inadequate entertainment. We buy books now because everybody else reads them or because we subscribe to some uh, uh, book club. But most of the books we read are worthless. And it probably is just as well that they won't last very long because they weren't worth anything in the first place. In the past, reading was a great art. Even in the early years of the present century, reading contributed tremendously to many aspects of human character. A wisely selected reading program 